Good afternoon. I'm Carol Christ. I'm the Chancellor of the University of California at Berkeley, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this special conversation between General H.R. McMaster and Lowell Bergman. Uh, this event is a collaboration between UC Berkeley's Goldman School of Public Policy, the Institute for International Studies, and the College of Letters and Science. I can't imagine a more timely moment to have this conversation where we're all thinking about the challenges facing the free world, uh, the case for responsible US leadership in world affairs and how that's all shaped by the media. I'm now gonna introduce our two uh, discussants. Uh, General H.R. McMaster is currently the Fuo and Michelle Ajami Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, the Bernard and Susan Leoto Fellow at the Freeman Spoli Institution, and a lecturer at, at the Stanford University School of Business. He was the 26th Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs during the Trump administration. After graduation from the United States Military Academy, General McMaster served as an active duty army officer for 34 years. He holds a PhD in history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He's the author of Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World and the award winning book, Dereliction of Duty, Lyndon Johnson, Robert McNamara, The Joint Chiefs of Staff and The Lies That Led to Vietnam. General McMaster is a highly decorated general who's been awarded among many other honors, a silver star, a purple heart, and an Army Distinguished Service Medal. In 2017, General McMaster succeeded Michael Flynn as the President Donald Trump's National Security Advisor. He resigned from the position uh, in March of 2018 and uh, then retired from the military in May. Lowell Bergman is the Emeritus Riva and David Logan Distinguished Chair in Investigative Reporting at the Graduate School of Journalism at Berkeley, where he founded the Investigative Reporting Program in 2006. Uh, Lowell was a producer and correspondent for the T PBS documentary series Frontline, a producer, uh, reporter, and director of investigative reporting at ABC News, and a producer for CBS's 60 Minutes. He's received many awards for his journalism, including a Pulitzer Prize for Public Service, three Peabody's, and numerous Emmys. His reporting has investigated the tobacco industry, worker safety violations, the systematic violation of environmental laws, and Al Qaeda. Uh, dean Henry Brady will close this program. He's the Dean of the Goldman School of Public Policy and the class of 1941 Monroe Deutsch Professor of Political Science and Public Policy at Berkeley. So um, I'm so much looking forward to this conversation. Hi, thank you, Carol. Carol, Chris, the Chancellor. By the way, this, uh, this event has been planned by the two of us for almost two years now. So it's a great pleasure to welcome General McMaster finally to Berkeley. Um, I wanted to just mention quickly that the Goldman School of Public Policy has done a lot of work on this and made this possible and thank Morris Smith, Professor Daniel Sargent, Professor Robert Powell and Hannah Young of the school. Now I wanna reassure all of you out there that we're gonna have time for questions at the end. We're gonna try to make sure that we block that out but we have a lot of time, a lot to talk about with General McMaster and welcome General McMaster to Berkeley, finally. It's virtually this time, but hopefully in person pretty soon. Um, and I wanna start out and begin by talking with you about something that makes you really unique. You're the first national security advisor to be a real historian with that PhD in, um, in history from North Carolina. How did that prepare you, that background in studying history, to become the National Security Advisor? What kind of perspective did that give you when you took on that job? Hey, Lowell. Hey, thanks a lot for this opportunity. It's great to be with you. Thanks to Chancellor Chris for the warm welcome and for the opportunity and, and Dean Brady and, and all of you who kind of signed in. Uh, I wish I could be there in person with you and, and it's, a, it's a real privilege to talk with you. Hey, thanks for that question. So you actually asked a historian about is it important to study history? I mean, Lowell, that's a, you know, the, 
<laughs> That's a dangerous well, question from to a, ask. Well, I know, but from a practical perspective, working no, for a president no, think, who no, doesn't... It's a, great, it's, a, it's a great question. Yeah, it's a great no. question. I mean, you know, Lo, Lo, I, was, I was walking down, my, down Walnut Street in Philadelphia, my hometown, um, and got a phone call on President's Day weekend, a Friday of President's Day weekend, and it was a Washington, D.C. number asking me to go to Mar-a-Lago the next day to interview uh, for her. Uh, for the National Security Advisor job. It came quite out of the blue. I wound up going there on Sunday, interview with the president on Sunday. He hired me on Monday. I flew back on Air Force One, didn't live in Washington, was never stationed in Washington, was flown back to my house, came back Tuesday afternoon and started work. So there wasn't a heck of a lot of time to prepare. But what I was grateful for was the opportunity to have studied and researched and written about national security and foreign policy decision-making in the decisions and in the period that led to an American war in, in Vietnam. And so it was quite surreal, Lowell, to walk into the West Wing of the White House and into really what I thought was McGeorge Bundy's office, right? The, the National Security Advisor who was a, a principal character in, in, in dereliction of duty. And of course, I resolved, as you might expect I would, to try to at least avoid making the same mistakes that I, that I wrote about uh, during that period of time. And, and foremost among those mistakes was the, the tendency in the run-up to the Vietnam a war to not really think holistically about the situation in Vietnam and the challenges that that posed and the nature of the conflict. We didn't, we didn't spend enough time, those leaders at the time, didn't spend enough time applying design thinking and, 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 to, and to understanding the, the nature of the problem. So you know, I put into place in the National Security Council staff what we called a principal small group framing session, where before we talked about, hey, what are we going to do about X challenge to national security? Right, Chinese economic aggression and Chinese uh, efforts uh, to establish exclusionary areas of primacy across the Indo-Pacific and challenge us globally, we first said, okay, what is the nature of this challenge? What are our vital interests that are at stake? The second big lesson was that, that you know, we went to war in Vietnam without a clearly understood and clearly articulated objective. And in fact, um, George Bundy had argued, hey, it's, it, it's an advantage not to have an objective because then you know, if, if we lose in Vietnam, we can say, oh, Hey, we never wanted a free and independent South Vietnam anyway. And it would give, in George Bundy's words, Lyndon Johnson flexibility in the domestic political realm. And this is why one of the chapters in that book is entitled War Without Direction, right? And, and then the third, the third uh, lesson that I brought in with me that I tried to administer a corrective to to not make the same mistakes was that there was a tendency for president's advisors to try to decide, hey, what does Lyndon Johnson want? You know, what advice does he want to hear? And then they gave him what he wanted. And they gave him the single course of action, the source, a course of action based on this, this flawed strategy of graduated pressure. But it was a strategy designed, designed really to allay the president's concerns that Vietnam would undo his domestic political agenda. And that was the fourth lesson, is to, to try to create a process that was relatively insulated from partisan political considerations and to, to develop and assess courses of action for the president, options for the president, based on what it was in our long-term interest, knowing, well, hey, there are going to be people who are going to have their say, right, on, on, in the, on the domestic political side as part of it. But I didn't want that to be infected in the process. And, and this is one of the reasons why I rewrote the National Security Policy Memorandum and changed the composition uh, of the National Security Council staff. Now, in retrospect, in your, in your book, in Battlegrounds, you go through all the disappointments and disasters uh, the wars that we've been in from Iraq to Afghanistan, you go through the situation with Iran, even climate change. And you say that our missteps are due to something called strategic narcissism. I thought at first maybe you were ref reflecting on this, a psychiatric profile of the president, but, uh, but you had something else in mind. Could you explain why you think there's a thread that goes through all of these major missteps and and catastrophes in some cases. Well, well, this is, I think, the principal cause of our loss of strategic competence, the loss of our strategic competence, especially after the end of the Cold War. Strategic narcissism is, is meant to describe this phenomenon of which we tend, Americans tend to define the world only in relation to us. And the problem with that is it's self-referential and it doesn't acknowledge the degree that the other or others have agency and influence and authorship over the future. And therefore we tend to create an understanding of the situation that comports with really what we would prefer to do 
rather than what the situation demands. We oftentimes neglect limitations on the degree of influence and agency that we have over complex challenges and, and problems. And I think this tendency grew out of, out of optimism, optimism that, uh, that grew at, at the end of the Cold War. You know, we had reason to be optimistic, right? We, we witnessed the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War without firing a shot. We had the lopsided military victory in, in the Gulf War in 1991. And, and I think we bought in, Lowell, to these three assumptions that I write about in Battlegrounds about the post-Cold War world, assumptions that turned out to be to be false and, and fundamentally flawed. And the first among these is that there was this arc of history that had guaranteed the primacy and, and, and the, of our free and open societies uh, over closed and authoritarian systems. Ideological competition was, was a relic of the past, was passe. Related to that was this notion that the great power competition, it was also a relic of the past. It was over, right? The Soviet Union collapsed. China was, had not really yet grown in, in, in power significantly. And then, and then the third assumption was that our technological military prowess would ensure our security far into the future. And that if any foe had the temerity of challenging the United States, that war would be waged quickly, cheaply, and, and efficiently. And what I, what I write about in Battlegrounds roles, this was a setup. It was a setup for strategic shocks and disappointments uh, in the 2000s, foremost among them, the 9-11 the mass murder attacks, the most devastating terrorist attacks in, in history. And then, of course, the, the unanticipated length and difficulty of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, we often want to debate, hey, should we have done it? Meaning, should we have invaded Iraq in 2003? I think we ought to debate more often, who the heck thought it would be easy? And why did they think it would be easy? And then, and then of, of course, we have the financial crisis, 2008, 2009. And I think it was at that moment, at that moment when the Obama administration came into power, that that pendulum swung from over-optimism maybe some complacency associated with over-optimism uh, and, and a tendency to undervalue the, the costs and the risks of action to, to pessimism and resignation and a tendency to, to, to underestimate the, the costs and risks of inaction or disengagement. And, and I think we saw examples of that in the complete disengagement from Iraq in 2011, December 2011, and, and declaring that we're over uh, when in fact our departure helped set the conditions for the rise of ISIS, Al-Qaeda in Iraq 2.0, really, uh, and left ISIS ultimately in control of territory the size of Britain. Uh, I think also you could see it in the, in the decision against enforcing the red line in Syria after Syria committed mass murder of innocent civilians with the most heinous weapons on earth. You could see it maybe in Libya where the Obama administration, in an effort to avoid what it perceived as the flaws in the Bush administration's approach uh, to the Middle East actually exceeded those flaws by when I went, helping when, to unseat Gaddafi uh, by not, uh, but but not doing anything to shape the political outcome. So the so so Lowell, the argument in the book is, hey, let, instead of strategic narcissism, replace it with strategic empathy, and in particular, pay attention to the agency that others, inc including our adversaries, maybe especially rivals and enemies, have over the future course of events. But, but you were you were in the uh, National Security Advisor for 15, 16 months, right? And did, 13, did you- 13 months. 13 months, 13 months. Oh. okay, 13 months. Don't you see what you were, what you were trying to do unravel in, since then? How do you feel well, now I, that you yeah, look at absolutely. the in, negotiations in, in Doha with the Taliban? What does that well, mean? You know, in, 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 well, you know, of course, you know, the president can do what, what the president wants to do in, in the area of foreign policy, largely, of course, under the oversight and with, uh, you know, with, with some checks on him uh, in connection with Congress. But I saw it as my job role is, to, is to, to give the president access to the best analysis and advice across the departments and agencies and to give him multiple options. And it was in the discussion of those multiple options and the comparison of them that the president oftentimes went against his predilections, went, went against what he, he instinctively had thought that he would do as president. I think the most dramatic uh, example of that is one to which you've already alluded, which was the, the approval of this, the South Asia strategy uh, in, in, in uh, August of 2017. I think it was, that was the first time, really, Lowell, that we have had a sustainable, reasoned, sound policy and strategy in place for Afghanistan. I mean, sadly, the Afghan war is not a 20-year-long war. It's a one-year war fought 20 times over. Of course, as you already alluded, and I'm sure that everyone who's here tonight knows, the president backed away from that plan and prioritized, as the Obama administration had, 
uh, disengagement from Afghanistan over what I believe is our enduring interest there, which is to ensure that large portions of Afghanistan population centers, strategic locations, don't again come under the control of the Taliban and their, thereby also jihadist terrorist organizations aligned with them, such as Al Qaeda, uh, but also other groups, uh, to prevent another attack along, on the scale of, of 9-11. Uh, I believe that our level of commitment there had gotten down to a sustainable level over time that was enabling the Afghans to take the brunt of the fight against the Taliban uh, and, and to, to preserve the freedoms that the Afghan people have enjoyed since 2001. So, I, you know, I, of course, I regret you know, backing, backing off of, of the strategy that the president uh, approved. I think that it was a good decision in 2017 and a, 2017 and a bad decision you know, in, in 2018, 2019 and into this year. Uh, other, other policies and strategies, though, Lowell, I think stuck, right? I think the approach to China, the shifting the approach to China was long overdue. And, and I, I think that that's a, a, a strategy and a, and a policy that will largely be an element of continuity uh, between Trump administration and the Biden administration. Well, let me go on back to the Afghanistan question, because it looks from the outside like we now believe apropos of your strategic narcissism, that somehow the Taliban isn't going to go back and do exactly what they say they're going to do and what they did last time. Aren't the women of yeah, Afghanistan is, at risk? Isn't it yeah, a tragedy is like case. Vietnam? It's, it's, well, I think it could be worse even, Lowell. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, what you'll see in, in Afghanistan will be disastrous for the Afghan people, uh, but it also will be uh, a boon uh, to, to jihadist terrorist organizations. There, there are already over 20 U.S. designated terrorist organizations that exist in this terrorist ecosystem along the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. Uh, and these are groups that in, in some ways are stronger today uh, than Al-Qaeda was on September 10th, 2001. And one of the reasons they're stronger is because they are orders of magnitude larger than the Mujahideen era uh, you know, alumni, the, the alumni of the the resistance to Soviet occupation. And of course, it was elements of that, of that alumni who joined Al-Qaeda and who committed the 9-11 the attacks, members of it. So I, I think that, that we have a problem that is large in scale. And I'm talking about really the, the Al-Qaeda alumni, the ISIS alumni, the Lashkar e Taiba alumni. These are some of the most deadly and, and brutal, uh, you know, uh, inhumane uh, terrorist organizations in the world. And, uh, and they, of course, are in pursuit as well of, of some of the most destructive weapons on Earth. Uh, we, we are experiencing and seeing, I think, kind of the democratization of destruction uh, in which many of these, these, uh, these non-state actors now have capabilities or are pursuing them uh, that are the cap destructive capabilities previously associated only with nation states. So we, we are in a period, I think, of increasing danger and, and, and our disengagement, our disengagement from this complex problem alongside partners, right, across, uh, across uh, um, allies and, and coalitions, and, and especially with our indigenous partners in, in Afghanistan, I think also increases the risk to us and to all humanity. And yet we don't see very much about those consequences in the media and in the news while we talk about well, there mean, are these I, I ongoing say, negotiations. Hey, 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 well, where's the humanitarian you know, outrage, right? I mean, you know, we have conjured up the enemy we would prefer in Afghanistan rather than the real enemy in connection with the Taliban, as you already alluded to. You know, we've we've tried too hard to disconnect the dots, right? We've we, we, we've we, we've we've described the Taliban as having a bold line, right, between their uh, organization and groups like Al Qaeda and the Haqqani Network and so forth. That there is no bold line, uh, and and also we've assumed, you know, hey, well, the Taliban they'll be better, they'll be more benevolent, right? They'll, they'll implement a, a, a more benign uh, version of Sharia. Well, what does that mean? I mean, is that mass executions in the soccer stadium every other Saturday? Is that every other girls' school bulldozed? In some of the areas where the Taliban have taken control during the offensives that they conducted during the peace talks, uh, they've gone into communities and destroyed the schools in, in these communities already. And so, you know, I, I think that it, this is this is an this is an element of self delusion, self delusion based on this tendency towards strategic narcissism. Now, I have one thing about your book that uh, you go through, um, whether it's the Paris Accords, the Iran deal, uh, Iraq, Iran, in, 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 and what we, we, how we look at them and using strategic narcissism as the sort of uh, 
uh, your Occam's razor for trying to understand what's going on and what's real and what's not. And yet you yourself oppose getting out of the Paris Accords, oppose getting out of the Iran deal and, and want to stay in Iraq and Afghanistan. So it seems like well, a kind yeah, of- I mean, well, that's because I was view, I'm viewing these challenges through the, through the lens of our vital interests. So to take those just quickly one by one, I argued to stay in the Paris Accord because I thought we needed to work within the Paris Accord over time to get to real solutions on climate change. But as I write in the, in the, in the, uh, the, the final chapter of, of Battlegrounds, now as I've done more research and I've learned more about the interconnected problems of, uh, of, of climate and environment and energy security and food security and water security, you know, the climate, I mean, the, the Paris Climate Accord is a danger, right? It's a danger because it gives us a false sense of security. It actually has done nothing to address, address the problem of, of global warming uh, and, and the principal cause, which is man-made carbon emissions. And so I think you know, it's time for us really uh, to, to, uh, to, to seek what Professor Robert uh, Richard Mueller, uh, who's a great physicist there uh, at Cal Berkeley says, hey, we need, we need real solutions, no more non-solutions uh, to, to the problem of, of, of climate change. And, and that's what I advocate for in, in battlegrounds and, and on, the, on the Iran nuclear deal, you know, the, the title of that chapter is a bad deal. I, I, th I thought it was a bad deal. Maybe it wasn't the worst deal ever, as President Trump has said, as a historian, we don't, we tend to shy away from making those kind of hyperbolic claims, but it was a bad deal. And it was a bad deal because we made too many concessions, right? It was a weak agreement, uh, the sunset clause, inadequate uh, verification uh, regime. I mean, do you really trust the Iranians? I don't think we should, you know? <laughs> and then, and then it, it didn't address the missile program. And, and then of course, the biggest problem is it, it divorced really that agreement that weak agreement during which we made so many concessions that it really became a political disaster masquerading as a, you know, as a, as a diplomatic triumph, uh, we, we, uh, we gave a big payoff to the Iranians uh, in terms of really cash up front, uh, but then in, in the form of the relaxation of, of sanctions. Hey, what did they do with that money? I mean, I, I, I cover this in, in the book. They applied that money to their four decade long proxy war against the great Satan, us, you know, the, the little Satan, Israel, the Arab monarchies. Uh, and so the, my recommendation on, on, on Iran is, hey, force that regime to, to make a choice, right? You can either be welcome into the international community and enjoy the benefits of it, or you can be essentially a terrorist state, but you can't have it both ways. And, and I think one of the greatest flaws of the JCPOA is it did, in effect, empower Iran across the greater Middle East and did so in a way that accelerated and intensified the sectarian civil war in the region that, is, that has caused so much human suffering and, and caused really a humanitarian uh, and, and a political catastrophe in the region. So we, before, I, I wanna make sure we get, we bring this, uh, this, in a sense, this story back home. Are we guilty of strategic narcissism by avoiding listening carefully to what President Trump or watching what President Trump is doing now, undermining the election that the, an election that resulted in him losing, are we avoiding what we're actually hearing from the tens of millions of people apparently who follow President Trump? That, for example, uh, Michael Flynn, former Lieutenant General, I'm su sure you know General Flynn, now advocating that the president suspend the Constitution and do another election. Is there a possibility, really, of and this seemed to come out while your book was coming out, uh, the worry about real civil strife, maybe civil war here at home. Yeah. Hey, I would say, Lowell, hey, we shouldn't worry about it. I, I'm telling you. I, it can't our, happen our here? Did, it can't you know, happen our, here? No, I'm, not, I'm just saying, hey, you know, let's, hey, let, let's look at the facts, right? Let's look at, at what, our, what, our, what our founders set up. Our founders set up a system of government based on a bunch of worst case scenarios, right? These were people who had in their historical memory the bloody wars of England in, in the 17th century. And, and so they, they, they designed the whole thing for a worst case scenario. They designed it for like an Oliver Cromwell, right? Who is, is worse than Donald Trump, right? And, and so what they did is they, they put into place a system in which the executive branch has no role in the transition. I mean, if the American people do, the voters do, you know, so, and, and if there are challenges to the sanctity of our electoral system uh, and charges of fraud, those are adjudicated and they have been adjudicated which shows the strength of our judicial system and the strength of, of due process and, and rule of law in our, in our country. You know, there's a lot of lamentation 
uh, about, you know, hey, gosh, is he going to leave? Like, yo, he doesn't have a say if he's going to leave or not. You know, if there weren't enough electoral votes uh, to, to deliver a decisive outcome, which is obviously not the case, then it would go to the House of Representatives. Again, the executive would have no role in this. And so, Lo, I, I just think that there's been a lot of hyperbole, hyperbole about it, you know, predictions of the demise of our democracy. Many of those predictions have been based on, well, gosh, look how divided we are. Hey, you know, records, numbers of Americans voted, right? And, and uh, of course, if we weren't divided, we'd be a one-party system. That looks, that looks like China to me. Not a, not a good place, a spot to be in. So, you know, I, I'll tell you, Lowell, I, I just, I'd reject this idea that, you know, that we're living in Weimar, Germany, that some, as some people have alluded uh, and, and you know, we don't want to be complacent about the strength of our, our democratic institutions and processes, uh, but, but we also ought to not be, you know, unrealistically you know, pessimistic about it. Uh, the president should be, you know, he should be criticized, condemned for, you know, for this demagoguery, you know, for uh, making false claims, uh, you know, about, uh, about uh, corruption and, and, and dra- raising doubts about, about the, uh, the, the security of our electoral uh, system. You know, what's 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 sad, sad about it uh, is that is that the Trump administration vastly improved our, our, the, the security of our elections with the Cyber Infrastructure Security Agency and, and what Sean and his team did there. Of course, that you know, him saying but he got that, fired. Got fired. Right. Yeah. So. So. It, but, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a little we're, we're going to survive this. Right. We've been through worse. We've been through worse. And we're coming out of, of course, a quadruple crisis. Right. It's a. It's a crisis, as you as you mentioned, of confidence. I think in who we are as a people, in our democratic principles, and institutions, and processes. And it's a, a crisis of the pandemic. It's a crisis of the recession associated with the pandemic. It's a it's a crisis associated uh, with the social uh, divisions and racial divisions laid bare by George Floyd's murder and the and the protests and the violence that followed and the and the grave and, and legitimate concerns about inequality of opportunity in our country and unequal treatment under the law. Uh, and this crisis of this because this vitriolic partisan uh, presidential election that we that we're still in the midst of. Okay, but but hey, you know we're going to get through it, Lowell. And and I think it's incumbent on all of us to bring our fellow Americans together, you know, to have respectful, meaningful discussions, right, about, about the challenges that we face uh, as, as as a way to work together. You know, as as I highlight in the book, I think in these challenges to national security and these interconnected problems that we're facing, if we just began our discussions to try to have a better understanding of the problems and then started really a conversation with, Hey, what can we agree on? And we could get a heck of a lot done. Well, you know, and, and, uh, and, and what I'm concerned about is these centripetal forces, you know, that are pulling us apart from each other in many ways in the pandemic hasn't helped, you know, but in many ways, this is already a trend. We are better connected to one another electronically, but more distant from one another psychologically and emotionally. And I think all of us have a role in, and bringing our fellow Americans together uh, in, in a respectful environment in which we empathize with one another, you know, you, and, you, you, and, you, and work together for a better future. You, you allude towards the end of your book that, and a little bit in the beginning about the fact that, uh, and uh, the, the fact that most Americans get their information over and through the internet. And it, it's, it's the wild west, anything goes. And we know that tens of millions of people believe things that are demonstrably false, like the election was rigged, that it wasn't the safest election in history. And there's a lot of anger out well, there. How are you gonna change yeah. that reality? Well, I, I think it's what you're doing at Berkeley. It's what you're doing there. It's what Chancellor Christ is doing. It's what Dean Brady and all the students, especially, and, and, and faculty, which is to educate one another, to educate ourselves. I mean, I, I write in Battlegrounds, this was essentially a continuation of my own self-education. And I think the greatest strength of our nation is an educated populace. I think it's a lack of education that leads people to seize on orthodoxies, to seize on on conspiracy theories. And it's really ignorance. What I've seen in places, Lowell, where where the situation's really bad, right, where these there is tribalism and tribal identity and disunity and conflict and struggles for power and and, and resources, right? What, what what the problem is there oftentimes is ignorance. And that ignorance is used to foment hatred, and that hatred is then used to justify violence, right? That's a cycle we don't want to see in our country. So I think education, education, education are the top three answers to that, to that question. Uh, but then also, it's, it's, we need reforms, right? We need, we need reforms in, in government. Hey, you know, I think we should be proud of 
Uh, we should be proud of the great achievement of our revolution and the radical idea that sovereignty lies neither with king nor parliament, but with the people, right? And celebrate the fact we have a say in how we're governed. At the same time, we can be disappointed that the unalienable rights in our, Consti in our, in our Declaration of Independence and the, the Bill of Rights in our Constitution went unrealized, and realized in part because it took us 100 years to remove the greatest blight on our history, which is the institution of slavery. But heck, we should be able to take pride in the fact that we emancipated 4 million of our fellow Americans in our most destructive war in history. And of course, again, we can be disappointed, recognizing that a republic requires a continuous nurturing like our founders said it would with the failure of reconstruction and the rise of Jim Crow and the Ku Klux Klan and separate but equal, but then again, celebrate the triumph of, of the civil rights movement and the dismantlement of, a, of dis, de jure, uh, you know, se segregation and de jure inequality of opportunity, recognizing we still have de facto segregation and, and inequality of opportunity. Hey, that's something to work on. That's something we can work on together. You know, well, and then, so I, I think that that we we need a a better and, and a better informed view of history. I think, well, and you've seen this in, in your generation, I think especially since the Vietnam War, in the academy, uh, the academy in the humanities has been dominated in large measure by the, the orthodoxy of the new left interpretation of history. And and it, it has the cutting through it a mild form of self-loathing. And hey, man, we want to remain critical. We don't want you know, a contrived, happy view of our history. But at the same okay. time, oh, as, wait, Richard, wait, wait, as, no, Richard wait Wartsy, here, as Richard Wurtzy said, Lo, <laughs> as Richard Wurtzy said, you know, the national pride is, is to nations what self-respect is to individuals, you know, a well, necessary yeah. ingredient for self-improvement. And so, you know, we all have work to do. I would say your profession has some work to do. I think the fourth estate is in bad shape. Uh, and I think, I think it's in bad shape because it's been caught up in this vitriolic partisan polarization that we've, we've seen. It's exacerbated by the pseudo media and, 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 the, and the, you know, the, the conspiracy theories that sometimes our leaders aid and abet, including the president, like this crazy QAnon stuff. And then you have you know, the, the so, social media, which uses algorithms based on the avarice of these country, companies to make more and more advertising dollars to show us more and more extreme content and pull us further and further apart from each other. Okay, yeah, this is a big problem. Okay, but it's a problem that we can work on together. And I believe we can come together as Americans and work on it, work on it together. So some people I know are out there want to know, you know, want to know things that are in your next book. So let's try a, a question from Douglas Goldman. Uh, General McMaster, why is do you the, think- Is this the cookbook? Is this the, the, my, my, uh, my, 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 the cookbook I'm working on, Lowell? Yeah, the cookbook, right? That'll tell us how you how you cook the books with Donald Trump. I guess is the, <laughs> is the, is the, is the question. Why do you think Donald Trump kowtows to Vladimir Putin? Mr. Goldman wants to know. Well, you know, I, I'll tell you, I, I write about this. I write about this in in, uh, in battlegrounds, you know, and and what I try to do is I try to place this what I see as irrational behavior on the part of the president that gives. Uh, Putin, uh, you know, the, the, too much of the benefit of a doubt and doesn't call him out for even the most egregious, uh, the, the most egregious aggression against us, right? This is enabling uh, Putin's implausible deniability, right? But I put it in, in the context of, of strategic narcissism vis-a-vis -vis Russia across three administrations. George H.W. Bush looking into Putin's soul, remember that? And, mm -hmm. and, and, and then you had uh, Secretary uh, Clinton bringing the reset button to Lavrov in, in Geneva, President Obama leading over to Medvedev, who was keeping the seat warm, you know, for Putin saying, hey, we'll have more flexibility after the election and trading off of missile defenses in, in Poland in the hope of a better relationship with Vladimir Putin. And then you, have, of course, have President Trump's inexplicable behavior, you know, at Helsinki, uh, you know, which was, uh, thank God it was gone uh, by, by, by then. <laughs> and uh, and, and, and the, the reluctance here. Yeah, well, why do you uh, think he does? Why? The poisoning of the colony and so forth. But let me, let me bring you back well, to the I, question. What you hear him say, what you hear him say, right? I write about this extensively in Battlegrounds. So uh, I, I think ignorance of history contributes to it, right? I mean, there is this narrative out there that, hey, hey, Russia's just, you know, they're our natural ally because they were our allies during World War II. Well, you know, this just shows really the danger uh, of, uh, of knowing just a little bit of history. Or, or, or abusing it, right? I mean, people forget about the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and the fact that, 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 uh, that the Soviet Union was complicit with, with Nazi Germany and, and that we were an ally uh, that, that was not of by design. Uh, it was by necessity after 
uh, after the Nazis invaded them in, in June of, of 1941. So, I mean, I just think, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, there, there are, you know, there, there, there are, are uh, explanations involved in lack of understanding of history and seeing, seeing Putin as, as the bulwark, right? The bulwark against uh, jihadist terrorists, right? And, and this affinity uh, with, with him for that reason. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, this is self-delusional, right? Vladimir Putin, as I write in the book, is driven by uh, a sense of honor lost uh, and an obsession with restoring Russia to national greatness. Okay, well, hey, Russia can't compete with us on our, on our own terms, right? The economy is the size of Italy's economy. But so what, what Putin's theory of, of the game, you know, is, is strategy is to drag us all down and you, be the last man standing in, in Europe and, and these of Europe and the United States. And, and to do so mainly through a sustained campaign of political subversion, a component of which is cyber-enabled information warfare against us. Uh, I, I believe that you know the, the president has aided and, and abetted uh, Putin by not calling out this behavior, not pulling the curtain back on it, which is really the first step uh, in, in, in countering it. And uh, and so I, you know I think that you know across the political spectrum, what we what we need to do I think is demand better of our political leaders. I, we have seen the tendency I think on the part of the president certainly and most dramatically in recent days uh, and weeks. Uh, but also uh, in, 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 among other political leaders uh, as well, it's a, a tendency to compromise our principles to score partisan political points. So I think the American people have to expect better uh, of their of their uh, of their but, leaders and and, uh, but, and ensure but, that they act in our interests. You don't American. get you don't get nervous when you see the president remove the secretary of defense and put someone with literally no background in administering a major department. Um, and and putting in the undersecretary role uh, someone who you dismissed from the National Security Council, uh, a young man well, who was supposed. Hey, hey, Lo, hey, Lo, hey, Lo, when are we going to stop talking about Donald Trump? I hope soon, man. I mean, I, you know, I, I think you know, I, 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 hey, Lo, you know, I, I mean, of course, this is cause for concern, so, right? I mean, a period a period of transition is already a turbulent period, and what you want is you want your leaders. Uh, to ensure a degree of stability and, and to ensure a smooth transition. Well, well I think okay. the question hey, then, that's, but then, that's not, then, that's not well, Donald Trump's DNA. But but also, I'll tell you a little. Let's stop talking about Biden. Donald Trump. Is he just really okay. a, a passing phenomenon? But there still are tens of millions of people who believe and want change in a direction that he represents. That maybe well, I mean, he's just well, the first it, it, part it, it, of a wave. It, it, well, it's it's a democracy, right? I mean, there there are there are I, I think there are very encouraging results from this election. Uh, there were people who didn't want to sign up for the Democratic agenda, so uh, but they didn't like Trump. So what did they do? They voted against Trump and they voted down ticket on, for the Republican Party. Hey, that's a good thing, right? That shows that our politics have not become personalized, uh, and the people are are voting on, on issues as they see them and what's in the best interest of of them and, and their families, right? You know, what about this idea that, that there was a hard block of minorities that was gonna vote one way or the other? Well, large numbers of minorities voted for the Republican party as well. And we ought to celebrate that. We don't want you know, people to, to define what political party they vote for based on the color of their skin. You know, that's crazy, right? So, I, you know, I think there's some encouraging results, Lowell. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not ready like you apparently are to, to announce the demise <laughs> of our Republic. You know, so, so, you know, of course these are causes for concern, but but we ought to also have confidence in the strength of our institutions, right? We're not a monarchy. I mean, heck, we fought a revolution over that. So um, one, of, one of the people, uh, Phil Strauss writes uh, and, and wants to know before we run out of time, what is Trump like to work on a day-to-day -day basis? What is he like well, to be around? Right? It's, well, it's kind of, you know, a well-oiled machine. It's har harmonious. Uh, well, no, I'm, I'm joking, okay? But hey, I, you know, <laughs> he's, he's a unique guy, right? He's a unique person. And and uh, and you know he was elected president, and my job was uh, to to you know to to ensure that he got access to the best advice and analysis across the departments and agencies. And I, that I gave him multiple options. When we did that, it was effective. Now you know I left you know after 13 months. I can't really speak to what happened after I left. Uh, but but while I was there, hey, I saw it as my duty, right? I mean, I I served in the army for 34 years. This is my fifth commander in chief. Uh, and to, to, to provide the elected president with, with options. I think there are those who took a different approach to their duties and responsibilities. And I think this is really kind of the case in every White House, right? There are those who are there 
to do as I was doing as a, as a, a career uh, military officer who, by the way, I'd, I'd never voted. And I know that sounds strange. I, I vote now and I, I encourage all Americans to vote. But I, I, I wanted to keep, you know, obviously a, a, a bold line between the military profession and partisan politics. And I felt that it was important for me to, to take the, the, the extreme position that George Marshall had done, uh, had taken, uh, and, to, and to, not, to not vote. So I was sworn into West Point when I was 17 years old. And and I just the, last, the first time I voted was in this last presidential election. So, so I, you know, I, uh, I I was biased already in favor of doing my best to provide the elected president options. There are many civil servants who are also in that category. I think Fiona Hill provided a great example of the civil servant who who, who, ser who served with uh, with great distinction. And there are many many others with whom I interacted across the departments and agencies and on the NSC staff. But there's a second group of people. They come into an administration. Because they, they don't want to give the president options. They want to manipulate decisions consistent with their own agenda, right, on, you know, immigration or on, you know, uh, tariffs and, and trade enforcement, whatever it is, right? And, and, uh, and, and what they try to do is, is to undermine a process that gives options and instead do an end run. And then there's a third group of people who kind of define themselves in the role of saving the country, maybe the world from the president, right? And this is the, you know, the anonymous author and so forth. The problem with that second and third group of people is they're undermining the Constitution of the United States because sovereignty lies with the people and only the elected leaders are directly responsible to, to, to the people. And, and, and that's the president and the vice president. Of course, it's our elected members of Congress um, and, and these long term civil servants and others. Hey, nobody elected them. You know, nobody elected them to make policy. And so I think it's really important when you serve in the government to understand what your role is. And hey, there may be times uh, when you feel as, as if you continuing your duties and responsibilities will enable uh, illegal action uh, or maybe enable unethical action. And hey, that's time for you to go, right? But, but if you're there to serve the elected president, you're not there to make your own policies or to obstruct that president's legal decisions. To do so undermines our democracy. Okay, so I got a Berkeley question for you, which has to do with dereliction of duty, it comes both from a Frank Newhauser, and of course, you know the name, um, uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, it comes from Frank Newhauser, and, and, uh, and it's about dereliction of duty. Do you think the military would have won the Vietnam War if a civilian government had let the military operate freely? And would that have been a good idea? Was the Vietnam War a good idea? Now, hey, what, what, I wrote, what I wrote about in, in Derelict and Duty is very consistent with uh, the great historian of the Vietnam War, George Herring's interpretation, is that you know, that's really the, the, the right question is whether or not the, the war could have been won, that we could have guaranteed really the freedom and independence of South Vietnam at a cost acceptable to the American public. I think that the answer to that is no. And what I write about in, in Derelict and Duty, though, is how the way in which we went to war in Vietnam, the way that decisions were made, prevented any consideration of the long-term costs and consequences. And, and therefore, in retrospect, kind of it looks like Lyndon Johnson wanted to go and war, war in Vietnam, but he, he wanted to do nothing, nothing of the sort. So, so it didn't, the war didn't come with a decision for war. I mean, the war in Vietnam slunk in on cat's feet, right? And and that's what the story of the book is about, is how mm -hmm. the president's advisors compromised principle for expediency and hoped over time to get adopted uh, the, 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 uh, the strategy that they wanted. Uh, and they were complicit, therefore, in foreclosing on the kind of discussion that was necessary, the kind of discussion that's particularly important in, in matters of war, which are really matters of life and death. Well, you know, it was the name Daniel Ellsbury that was flew out of my mind because I spoke, spoke with him the other day on, and, and he, his question is, if the military had gotten its way over Johnson, they wanted to bomb all the way to the Chinese border. We would have had a world war or a nuclear war as a result. No? Is there a question in that? Or well, the question is, do you, do, where, do you think that the military strategy that, that, that Johnson was against was something that should have uh, should have gone into effect. Hey, hey, Daniel, read the book, man. You read it at the time and you sent me a nice note on it. So, I mean, I, of course I don't, <laughs> I, I don't cover that in the book and I don't argue that, that, that I don't argue that the Joint Chiefs of Staff's proposal should have been, uh, should have been approved, right? In fact, what, what, what is important, I think, about the, the book and the story of dereliction of duty 
is really the, the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff proposed nothing of the sort. Instead, what they decided to do is to mask those long-term costs and consequences and the degree of military action, resolute action, uh, as well as the numbers of troops that they thought were necessary, just to get the next step up the ladder, just get the first bombing runs off. Well, going back to January of 64, just get the first covert raids going under Op Plan 34 Alpha, then just get the first bombing runs off, then just get the first troops deployed. And so it was this gradual approach uh, to, to, the, to, these, to these decisions uh, that masked the long-term costs and consequences. If Lyndon Johnson had been confronted with the results of two war games in 1964, both of which concluded in 1968, right? There's a projection forward over four years from 64 to 68. The war game ended in 1968 with 500,000 troops in, in South Vietnam with no prospect for success and the American people losing faith with the effort. Hey, sound familiar? And, but, but of course, these, you know, these, were, these results were disregarded. And, and, uh, and so what I argue in the book is, hey, these were people who not only should have known better, but who did know better and who did it anyway. Okay, we have, we have a question about China and because we've passed over it, uh, I wanna ask you uh, this question from Chris Hufnagel. Could you talk more about the tussles with China, especially the technology, the, the struggle about Huawei? What's your long, our long game if there's a risk of becoming less competitive by being more belligerent with China? Well, I would say we're not being belligerent with China, right? I mean, hey, let me just tell you what I think are the three misunderstandings, to be a little bit Chinese here. These are the three misunderstandings about the, com the, the competition with China. Hey, the first of these is, hey, this is a U.S.-China problem. And I think because of our narcissistic view and because a lot of people you know, don't like Donald Trump, I know that might come as a surprise to me, right? That they think the interpretation is, well, you know, Donald Trump is just so mean and belligerent, darn it, that Xi Jinping is acting out against that meanness and belligerence. Well, hey, let's just take a look at the record just uh, this year alone, right? How about foisting COVID-19 on the world? How about, how about going after and punishing the doctors that were trying to raise the alarm bells? How about subverting the World Health Organization against its very purpose? How about adding insult to injury with wolf warrior diplomacy across the globe, especially in Europe, but across the globe? How about bludgeoning Indian soldiers to death on the Himalayan frontier? How about boasting that you're going to put additions on the, on the concentration camps in which you've interned 1.5 million Uyghurs uh, because because they really like being re-educated, as Xi Jinping said in, in, the, in the last month. How about extending the party's repressive arm into Hong Kong? How about aggressive actions and sinking Malaysian and Vietnamese vessels in the South China Sea just in recent months uh, in what would be the la largest land grab in history in, uh, in, in, uh, in this, if they succeed? The, the threats toward Taiwan. Look at the economic coercion at Australia. Hey, how about cyber attacks on our medical research facilities in the middle of trying to develop a vaccine to get us out of the darn pandemic? Hey, okay, explain to me again. How about taking you know, Canadian hostages, right, for now going on two years in captivity and Xi Jinping saying, hey, what do you mean? You know, hostage taking is part of our foreign policy, right? I mean, how is this a U.S. China problem? This is a free world China problem. The, the second misunderstanding is that there hasn't been uh, international cooperation. There, there really has been international cooperation. Uh, and then the final is that the final one is that, hey, we face a stark choice, right, between either a combination of the party or a disastrous war. Okay, there's a lot of middle ground there in which we can compete in a transparent way and with partners to over time, hopefully, maybe convince the Chinese Communist Party they can have enough of its dream of national rejuvenation without doing so at the expense of its own people stifling human freedom inside of, of China uh, or at accomplishing its objectives at our expense, the rest of the world's expense. And so that's the approach I think we really have to take is one of transparent competition. And it's it was long overdue, I believe, uh, it, when I came into the job as National Security Advisor. I think it's the most significant shift in U.S. Par foreign policy since the end of the Cold War. And it was long overdue and it was necessary. Um, it is a sound strategy and a sound approach. It's been imperfectly implemented. You know, I don't know what what, what steel and aluminum tariffs on our allies, you know, how that helps us get to, to China's problem, for example. You know, there are some own goals uh, in this, but hey, uh, I think this will be an element of continuity with the Biden administration. I worked very hard to make this a bipartisan uh, policy at the outset. Uh, and, and I believe that the view that we have to compete much more effectively, you know, is, is a strongly held uh, among, among uh, you know, House members like Nancy Pelosi and senators like Chuck Schumer, 
uh, as it is among the Republican counterparts, for example. Well, it's a natural point to ask, what do you think of the Biden administration to be? The people he's appointing, the policies he's talking about, for instance, reopening negotiations with Iran. How does that hit you? Well, I mean, you know, hey, listen, th these are these are these are great American citizens and, ser and public servants, right? I think we have to get out of this personalization of politics, right? We have to have respect for one another. We can we can disagree with each other. <laughs> you know, there's probably not a whole heck of a lot uh, that certain members of that administration I agree on from a foreign policy perspective. Hey, but that's okay. That's all right. You know, and and uh, and I wish them all the best. I want them to succeed. I think the that uh, President Elect Biden's message to the American people about being a president for all Americans has been immensely positive and, 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 uh, and, and, uh, and, and welcome. Uh, I, I think that you know, some of the approaches to foreign policy are certainly nascent, as you would expect, because they're not even, uh, the president's not sworn in yet. President-elect is not sworn in yet. Uh, but but I, you know, I think there's a lot of talk about strengthening our alliances, and that's good, okay? But I think I would just say, hey, you know, alliances are, are a lot more than you know, a positive atmosphere in cocktail, at cocktail parties, you know, with our European allies, right? The alliances have to be for a purpose. And I think there's an opportunity to galvanize more international cooperation on the threat from the Chinese Communist Party, for example, or strengthening NATO against Russia's political subversion and acts of aggression that fall below the threshold that might elicit a military response. There is a way, I think, to galvanize multinational support for, I think, what, what is necessary, a, sl a slight reversal uh, a reversal to the to the approach to Afghanistan. Whether they'll do that or not, I'm not sure. I think in many ways, Lowell, the, the greatest uh, deficiencies in Trump administration policy has been where, where the Trump administration doubled down on the deficiencies of the Obama administration policy, right? But but of course, you know, people learn from the past, and I, I hope that they'll resist the impulse uh, to do two things, right? Once one is to hey try to turn the clock back to 2016, because I think that we were in a really uh, difficult and disadvantageous position in 2016. And the second thing that I hope they resist doing is defining their foreign policy mainly as in opposition to the previous administration's foreign policy. And they look at these challenges on their own terms and recognize that there will be elements of continuity, as I, I think there will be, uh, on, on the on the China policy, for example. And I think that there, that, that there by necessity, there will be some elements of discontinuity. Um, but I think it would be a mistake you know, to turn the clock back. Turn the clock back on China. It would be a mistake. That would be a huge mistake. Yeah, a huge mistake. <laughs> and and they, they won't do it. I don't think they'll do it. I mean, I really, I think that, you know, I think that um, there's there's a great deal, as I mentioned, of, of bipartisan support for the competitive approach to China. But hey, if I could give you know, any advice, it would be, hey, don't fall for it. And it is Chinese Communist Party false promises for cooperation, like on climate change, for example, in exchange right, for going back to a policy of cooperation and engagement with China. You know, Xi Jinping just made the speech, right, where he said, hey, we're going to be carbon neutral by 2060. Hey, but just watch what he is doing. They're building 70 coal-fired plants a year, right? Each one of those plants, as probably many of you know, burns you know, a ton of coal every 10 seconds, right? And so these are plants that they're building not only in China, but across Africa, right? The largest carbon emitter in Kenya has just been constructed by China, thank you, you know, right next to a UNESCO World Heritage Site, right? So, hey, I, I think we can't buy what Xi Jinping says. He cloaks, you know, the, in, the, in the language of, of cooperation, uh, an extremely aggressive policy, like this language of a, you know, a, a community of common destiny. Hey, what does that look like? You know, look at Zimbabwe. That's the China model perfected. Uh, at, a, at, a, at a micro scale. How's that working out for Zimbabweans? So I, I think, you know, we have to be clear eyed about the threat and we have to watch what China does. Don't listen to what they say uh, because these are false promises. Okay, well, we're, we're getting close to the end and I've got a, I got a, um, a question from the East Coast. Are, are you still a Phillies fan? I am a Phillies fan for sure. And, you know, I'm an Eagles fan too, which is very sad at the moment, you know, but, but, um, you know, we'll get through it. You know, Philadelphia's been through hard times. It's like our democracy, right? We got our ups and downs, you know, but we remain strong. And, and uh, I think the Phillies with some relief pitching, uh, you know, could, could do it, could do it next year. <laughs> okay. I think with that um, and with time getting close, uh, I want to introduce Dean Brady. 
um, the uh, head of the public policy school and uh, thank him actually for hosting all of this and being supportive of bringing you to campus. And Dean Brady, take it away. And thank you, uh, General McMaster. Hey, hey thanks a lot, it was fun, thanks. Well, thanks to Carol Christ for the introduction. Thank you to Lowell Bergman and General McMaster for a spirited and fascinating discussion of where we are in foreign policy in America right now. Um, thanks to Daniel Sargent for the uh, uh, co-sponsoring this through the Inter Institute of International Studies, uh, the College of Letters and Sciences for co-sponsoring it with us. Um, also, um, I wanna tell you a little bit about a new center we're starting at the Goldman School that's being started by Janet Napolitano, former president of the University of California, uh, former Secretary of Homeland Security and former governor of Arizona. Her new center uh, is going to be on politics and security, and it's going to try to look at uh, things like uh, election security, climate change security, uh, tech sector security, pandemic security, uh, the kinds of issues, the long-term issues that I think we face as a crucial part uh, of our future security in America and around the world. So we're really excited about this center. Stay tuned, you'll hear a, a big announcement we hope in January of exactly uh, where the center's going and what it's gonna be doing. Uh, I wanna thank the audience for being here uh, and thanks for your great questions. And then finally, I wanna note that there will be a recording of this on UCTV that will be available to people and uh, that should occur in the next week or two. Uh, thank you for being here. Thanks again to General McMaster. Uh, you can tell that he's a historian and we really enjoyed the historical perspective on so many important issues. Thank you so very much.